For Criminal Media's Polity, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Patrick Tarek Mele to discuss his book titled Cleaner's Boy, A Resistance Road to a Liberated Life. So in the beginning, Patrick, uh, you relate how you grew up in District 6 with your family. It was interesting how you say that outsiders may have labeled your community as a mix of poor, colored and white. But you didn't see that because you always say you were one people. What do you remember about growing up in District 6? Well, you know, I grew up in, in District 6 and its two neighboring areas, Woodstock and, and Salt River. And the whole thing about District 6 is, you know, I liken it very much to old Harlem in New York. It was a mix of a whole range of things, you know, cross color, cross religion. It had a, a, a vibrancy, uh, cross languages as well. It was a poor area, but it was the, the sort of oldest mixed urban area. And um, it goes back to slavery times uh, and the freeing of slaves and where those slaves uh, settled. And for me growing up there, I had you know, I didn't have a father, so I was just with my mother, and she was a, in, a working in a laundry a shop there. And um, I had, however, all of these customers coming in and out, and often my mother left me with various customers because the the shop inspector would come and they'd have to hide me away and so on. And so I had all of these mentors. And when you think of District 6, for me, I just always remember walking up Hanover Street and along... Hanover Street, towards the bottom end, there would be all these horse-drawn barrows filled with fruit and veg, and people would be you know, what we call skinnering. They, they were, would be gossiping about everything. These guys saw everything, and their, their discussions were animated. And as a child, you know, you, it was fascinating, both in the laundry shop and along the barrows, or down at the public toilets that my aunt was working at storytelling still part of me comes from that district and now as a cleaners boy your mother had to always look for your place to stay because most of the landladies didn't allow children in their homes i always say to people my mother was the saddest person i've ever known in life and she had a, a really struggling life staying in back rooms of boarding houses and so on and they didn't allow children and she had to work for a living and earn the pittance and in all of this she had to try and be a mother and that was extremely difficult she would have to leave me with other people and for lengthy periods of time i was in three foster homes before the age of seven and that scenario for her often led to her having mental breakdowns. She would not be able to cope. And I, I remember how she too would cry at times, you know, that she had to send her child away. So my pain was her pain too, and her pain was mine. And I grew up very much conscious of that. And that um, she was an ordinary, poor, working class woman, trying to battle through life. And that had a tremendous effect on me and my consciousness. Um, I had a very strong consciousness from very young that we were poor people. And I also had a consciousness that we were uh, in, a, in a society that boxed people. We were breaking all the rules. We were a mixed people. And, and that was our apartheid experience, an experience of being... Um, a family that were pulled apart simply because we were multi-ethnic and didn't conform to whiteness and the various boxes that uh, apartheid was putting us into. You also talk about how your mother told you that your father had died because she felt betrayed. How did you find out the truth that your father was, in, was alive at the time and how did that make you feel? Yeah, you know, I grew up with my mom telling me that my father died in a motor car accident. She would actually show me the spot and she would describe the accident and everything. And of course, it wasn't true. And as I was growing up, I realized because I had older siblings that 
they had a father and 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 I had their father's name, but their father was not my father. So that 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 sort of troubled me constantly. But a dramatic moment happened when I I, I went out to work when I was, was 16 and I was walking down the road to work one day to catch the train and a car sidles up to me and the man in the car says to me, um, listen, I'm your father. And I, you know, absolutely shocked and I immediately said, but my father's dead, you must be mistaken, mister. And then he started pointing his finger at me saying I'm a little scully and that I've been stealing his money and da 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 da. And it was a quite a traumatic thing. And I went to work. And the whole day at work, I was, this was going through my mind. And I come home in the evening and my mother's crying and she's pulling her hair and, and saying, why were you rude to your father? I said to my mother, but you said he's dead. You know? And she said to me, don't you be funny with me. <laughs> it almost the same words as he did. It was a traumatic scenario. And once I had pacified my mother that I wasn't going to leave with this man and so on, the following day, she went back to the story that she was a widow, that her husband had died in a motor car accident. And we never talked about it for the next 25 years. And only at that time in my late life, did I then start scratching around and invest. And I found that they had uh, uh, seven more brothers and sisters than I knew that my father was still alive and that he had had children with four different women. Uh, it was a whole, you know, it was a big part of my life. You know, the first of all, thinking I'm an only sort of child of a woman who's a widow and a husband has died um, to a point where I realize when I'm in my mid 40s that I'm one of 12 children, you know, from different uh, uh, mothers and, and one father. So it, that was that was just one of my experiences, which, of course, is captured in the book. <laughs> And growing up in District 6, that's where you were also politicized at an early age because your mother used to attend a union meetings. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I always smile when when at Kasatu and, uh, and uh, meetings and that today they sing, my mother was a kitchen girl, my father was a garden boy. And I grew up in that situation. My mother was a laundry cleaner and she was a sewing machinist in the factory. In District 6, as a child, we're talking about eight years old, I'd be sent to the barber, for instance, to have a haircut, and there you hear everybody talking. You know, In the laundry shop, you heard people talking. Along the fruit cellars, you heard people talking. And very often, they were talking politics, but not politics in the sense of political theories and so on and that. They were talking about their lives and how the apartheid government was impacting on their lives, and already some people were receiving this letter uh, which said that they were being forcibly removed because, you know, District 6 had something like 60,000 people. And they were all street by street. Their houses were bulldozed down and, and they were forcibly removed. And I also learned there was a lawyer, a communist lawyer called Mr. Harry Snitcher. And all the poor people used to go to him. My mom used to go to the union meetings back in the 40s and 50s. People like Moses Kotani would be there and have an office there, uh, a range of communists and, and ANC activists and union activists. Um, it was part of that culture. There were also writers and artists. And um, I was like a sponge as a child and I soaked in a lot of these things. And now you've also touched on the House of Fora, uh, the time when you were at a welfare institution, uh, Patrick. You describe in detail those inhumane conditions and horrible treatment that you endured at the time. It, it sounded like you were in prison. That must have been a horrific experience. Yes, it, it, it was four years of my life as, as a child. And um, effectively, it robbed me of my childhood. All the children that had been put there had come from the areas I come from to a large degree. And they'd all come from dysfunctional families, broken homes, and so on. And instead of getting a place of care, you know, um, the, the, the formal name of the place is a home. But I always talk of it as a children's asylum, because that is what it was. It was a, a place of abuse, torment, torture that no child should have had to have gone through. 
we besides the regular beatings uh, and when i say beatings beatings till you bled there was also manual labor i had a job to scrub a long hospital style passage um on my hands and knees as a eight nine ten year old child with a scrubbing brush and soap and would spend from seven in the morning till three in the afternoon scrubbing and being beaten while scrubbing um it it it, it was you're right it was very much a a prison like scenario and um and it affected me very deeply and i uh, a lot of the children who were with me at that time many of them are dead today they landed up in prison in gangs in in uh, uh, as street people and um it's a very sore part of my life while i was writing this book you can imagine i'm reliving a lot of this and i found myself crying very often for those who have not read uh, about the forceful removals of district 6 you actually witnessed the removals how how was it you know for people never mind how poor you are your abode is home and what happened was 60000 people over a 20 year it took them 20 years to destroy that place over a 20 year period starting in 1966 and ending in 1986 homes you know not just buildings homes were destroyed people were taken from their homes you'd get a letter and you'd be given x amount of time and and then suddenly bulldozers would be on your doorstep uh, a bucky or truck would be there to take your belongings and um and then you would be taken to the strange place on the cape flats where they built these little matchbox houses uh, away from the city district 6 in many ways was the heart and the heartbeat of the city they took the heart out of the city they took the people out of the city and dumped people and that experience from first of all worrying about being moved because you can imagine you know in the early days when i was a child and they were talking about this place here's this place which has got all of these old buildings many many streets nobody could imagine that somebody would come and literally you know take away this town uh, and destroy it so the first part was the worrying the people talking in hushed tones about what all of this might mean and many people saying oh, it will never happen and then it goes to you get the letter and the letter then tells you this is going to happen to you and you go into a crisis spin and then the bulldozers come and the trucks come to take your belongings and you end up you can't take everything with you and what's happening is there are these 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 vultures you know like you see sometimes these pickup trucks waiting for motor car accidents to happen there were these pawn shops general dealers in second hand furnitures and things like this we would come waiting there to see what you couldn't take with you and then offer you something for that and very often people had very old antiques um java bowls and all sorts of stuff and they would lose this and then you'd be taken to this god forsaken place and your whole life would have to start again you'd have to get used to this being home um the cape flats is and was a very inhospitable place for 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 habitat you would also not know your neighbors anymore because all sorts of people would be coming from different parts this district 6 wasn't the only place in cape town where there was forced removals there's a whole range of places there are places today um where where along the southern suburbs which fetch a lot of money for the properties and that um where people used to stay where black people used to stay and 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 for a child and a teen who had this affection to the area seeing this happen it's traumatic and it's what politicized me i didn't get politicized primarily from reading books i was politicized from an experience and lastly patrick what else would the readers get if they were to buy this copy look the book 
takes people on a on a journey, a very personal journey, which starts off with all of this that we've been talking about, the conscientization, the making of a political teenager. But the book then also talks about the journey of taking this resistance road. I talk about the subtitle resistance road to a liberated life. By, by taking this resistance road, um, I begin to become the man who I am today. Uh, and it starts in a very traumatic way because there was this thing called race classification. And here was a youngster that on face value looked like just another white youngster. But my experience was a black experience. And I then am faced with officialdom, apartheid officialdom. And the first part of it is you will be classified and we will decide what you are and who you are. And that led to my clash with what was then called internal affairs. Today we call it home affairs, where at the age of 16, if you want to go and get a job or anything, you need an ID. So here I'm filling in the forms and I put colored in the ID. And the woman behind the counter says, no, you cannot put that. You're not, you're not colored, you are white. And I said, you don't tell me what I am and who I am. This is where I come from. This is my people. And I decide on this. She says to me, no, no, you, you, you're just wrong. You will need to go and explain this to the race classification board. There was something called a race classification board where you can apply to be reclassified or classified if you feel you've been wrongly classified and so on. And they were crazy people, it was white people. They would measure your forehead, your nose, um, where your cheekbones are, what kind of hair you have, um, how you speak. And then they decide who you are, what race you are. And I said to her, no, I have a cousin who went through that and I'm not going through that. You take what I say I am. So she then scribbled in their other, you know, you know there's a classification called other colors. So, um, but she said to me, as a parting shot, she said to me, I know what your problem is. It's got nothing to do with it. You do not want to go to the army. At that time, there was conscription for white young people. So I said, well, you're damn sure about that. I don't want to go to your army. Um, uh, but that is not the subject we're discussing now. We're discussing what you are going to put on my ID. And she said, ah, you just a, a, you're just a smart little communist. I'm going to sort you out. You'll see who, who's right here. And I ended up being uh, arrested uh, and taken into the military. And there, as a young teen, I was, what, 18, 18 years old, um, I said to them, you can take the horse to the water, but you cannot make the horse drink. And they said, we'll see. And they tried to beat it out of me. They, they, they issued me with a rifle and I just put my hands and I let it drop. And I said, and they told me to pick it up. I said, I won't pick it up. I'm not part of you. I do not want to be here. Um, the, this, this is not who I am. They then basically tried to beat it out of me. And I ended up uh, in a hospital bed, coughing blood and not being able to speak. And then they sent a white Afrikaans priest, Dumani to a chaplain to my bed to try and talk sense to me. So he said, no, the devil is in me. So he was trying to cast the devil out of me and whatnot. They then arrested me again and took me to Pretoria. And I, I went through two years of arrest and release, arrest and release within a military thing. And never once did I conform to taking arms, saluting, doing all of this they did everything. They even threatened to kill me. I had a gun put in my mouth at one stage and in my head. I had all sorts of things happen. They gave me over to the security police at Kompol building in Pretoria, where they then subjected me to a heavy interrogation. They didn't call me by my name. They always called me communists. They tried everything and they didn't get it right. And eventually I was released. I was, you know, I was a factory worker. And I joined a trade union by this time as well. So the book goes into, into all of this that ultimately forces me to go into exile in Botswana. 
And then I talk about my Botswana refugee experience, my training, my going to work in, in Lusaka at the ANC headquarters, my relationship with Owa Tambo, who took me in as a son. And he gave me a mentor, a man by the name of Wolfie Kodesh, um, who was the ANC logistics man. And, and there they molded me further into the person who I am. And I spent, you know, 14 years in exile, mainly running the printing press, a little bit of radio work and so, so on. And then the book goes about, goes into, uh, it, you know, it, it, that part of my life starts with the trauma of, of fleeing and crossing the border and that. And then we get to the, the trauma of coming back home again. And, um, and, and, and that whole experience is also explained. And then maybe one can also call it a trauma, the trauma of our political organizations letting us down in the way that we experience today. You invest your entire life into fighting for freedom and you have an imagination of what that freedom means. And for somebody from a poor background, that freedom means poor people should not be poor people anymore. Basic, very simple. And yet I see poverty having exploded. And I see that our country is not a poor bastard case. We had the kind of money that it takes to change the lives of poor people. And instead people in politics were putting that money in their pocket. So if I was a resistor to apartheid, why should I not be a resistor to what is happening now? Otherwise I betray my entire life. I betray everything, my people, some people find that easy to do and to live in a world of bling and, and, and status and so on. I can't do that. That's not me because then I've lost my soul. So this book is about the soul of a poor boy, a homeless boy who goes on a road to fight against a system that creates poverty, that creates homelessness. And I'm very proud of having been part of that struggle. There was Patrick Melley in conversation with Polity, discussing his biography titled The Cleanest Boy, A Resistance Road to a Liberated Life.